and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Simon van Eindhoven. And Simon uh, is currently um, at Archimatrix and he started as, uh, tw in 2020 as a machine learning researcher. He has a PhD in electrical engineering with focus on signal processing algorithms to analyze EEG fMRI data. And today Simon is gonna speak to us about falling walls, explaining, re explaining years of research in three minutes. And he's gonna take slightly longer than three minutes to explain it to us. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Uh, please go ahead. If you want to share your screen, you're welcome. And if you okay. want to also share videos, you just remember to click the sound button as well. Right. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. It's nice to be here. And I thank the organizers for devoting a full day to science communication. I think it's well deserved. Um, my personal opinion is that there's already like an overload of technical conferences. Let's give some more attention to science communication as well. So that's why I'm here today. Um, for all of you participants here, it's fantastic to see you all here because it means that you care about being a clear communicator, like, or you want to share your enthusiasm with an audience that is outside of your small bubble in your own research lab. So I think it's truly fantastic uh, that, to see you here all today. Um, who am I? I'm just, as was said already, I'm just a regular bloke. I'm not a professional researcher into communication. I'm not a presentation skill coach. I'm just an ordinary guy who discovered that it's uh, amazing to do uh, public speaking, or I, I at least discovered uh, an enormous joy in doing so. And I want to share that enthusiasm with you today and maybe inspire you to, to get your feet wet and uh, start doing it yourself. And so the previous speakers have already done a great job and I will try to put in my two cents about it. So I am fully aware of the irony of the format of today because uh, I'm coming to talk to you about public speaking. And of course, now we're all locked in our own uh, offices at home. It couldn't be uh, much more ironic, I think. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm gonna try to make it like an open conversation, keep it a bit interactive. Um, and that's why I would like to ask you a basic question as an icebreaker. So I will share my screen. Um, Anything we can help with? Just a second. I'm looking for the, ah, share sounds. There it is, all right. So if everything goes well, you should be seeing my screen now. And you see on the screen a big QR code, hopefully. Can the hosts confirm it? Yep. Yes, all right. I see it. So I invite you all to go to this QR code. It's basically a poll um, where I would like to ask you a first question. Namely, I'm interested in hearing who of you already did uh, once or twice or more times um, science communication in the form of public speaking? And with that, I mean to a non or like a non expert audience. So let's uh, disregard your colleagues in your research lab or maybe people at a conference, specialized conference. Just curious to see the response of the audience. So far, so good. Nobody that did it and had a bad experience. Oh, there's one person. I'll wait a bit more. But I'm very glad to see that uh, there's already like a handful of people who have done some communication themselves and really like the experience. That's great to hear. I'm totally on, on, in that club as well. Wow, it's really neck to neck between uh, the people with and without experience. That's cool. If everyone would have already uh, done uh, something of, the, of this form, there would be no need for me to speak here today. But okay, it seems that uh, many of you have already done so. So I will continue with the next question. And for that, I would like to ask you what you considered as some main obstacles 
um, when doing science communication and specifically public speaking, right? It's a bit a challenging format. I think we, we all agree that the, the first steps we take in uh, speaking in front of an audience can be scary, but uh, maybe there's other things. And I'm interested to see uh, what are like the main bottlenecks, the main obstacles that people experience. Okay, so a lot of people suffer from imposter syndrome. Like, it seems a very pervasive thing in academia. That's really too bad. Okay, you can continue uh, answering the poll if you want. Uh, but I will already um, move on with um, what I prepared for today. And what I will try to do is um, go over these obstacles, or in fact, I would like to call them fallacies, some of them, and I will try to refute them, or I will try to explain why there's no reason to be scared of them, right? So for that, I prepared some, um, some slides based on my experience with um, a certain format called Falling Walls. Now, Falling Walls is essentially a contest which is held in many places around the world. Uh, it's, it's the same format as Three Minute Thesis, which is a bit more uh, self explanatory. So, the format is very easy. Um, you essentially get three minutes to explain your research in a creative and fun way to an audience of uh, non experts, just people that are uh, have a certain interest in science and are curious to come for an evening to, to listen to what 10 uh, PhD students have to say. Um, so I participated uh, several times uh, in, in such a contest. And with that, I gained some experience, learned some tricks of the trade. And also I had to overcome several of these obstacles like in the last poll. And that's why I will try to share with you some, some, ticks, some tips and tricks, what I learned along the way and why I think it's totally um, why we should totally uh, try to um, overcome our, our fear or overcome these thresholds. And I, I'm sure that I will be able to convince you that it's possible. So one of the um, obstacles that, that people answered is that you can be afraid that uh, people don't find your research interesting, right? I think that's a core um, a fear that keeps you awake at night if you enrolled yourself for such a, co a contest, perhaps. But then my, I think this is, um, this is uh, just not right, you know? I will give you an example of the Falling Walls contest in Leuven that I participated in. There was um, one of the candidates, Franz was his name. Now Franz, Franz was an archeology span um, student, archeology span PhD student, and not the average PhD student, I think. Franz was about uh, 60 years old. This guy uh, was uh, working his whole life, uh, but he had a genuine interest in archaeology and he started uh, his PhD in his 60s. So quite special, I think, already. And his, uh, his topic was about analyzing certain carving patterns in stone at archaeological ruins. So it's not the perhaps the most uh, thrilling topic. It's not AI, it's not biotech, etc. But I want you to look at how he started his talk. So I'm going with you now to the recording of the Falling Walls conference that was held um, in September last year. So watch how France starts this talk. Not many people care about stone carving techniques, but I do. Usually people see a fallen wall but I'm looking at... Okay, so the connection is a bit poor, but I hope you heard the beginning of his talk properly. You don't hear the sound of the audience, but I can assure you, I can guarantee you that the whole audience was uh, 
laughing at this guy being so confident about his intro and he was uh, keeping the attention for the audience for the full three minutes uh, talking about how his analysis of uh, the the carvings in in the stone ruins at um, archaeological sites how they told um, researchers something about how people used to live back in the days so i think that uh, this argument people won't find my research interesting that can we can toss it right into the dumpster right it's simply not true people will uh, fall in love with what you have to say regardless of your topic i'm i'm a strong believer for that they will not uh, fall in love with what you're saying but more how you're saying it can you uh, draw the attention of your audience uh, if yes uh, you can sell them whatever topic you have to say then another obstacle uh, that uh, people experience is uh, fear of a uh, blackout, right? It's uh, a genuine concern, of course, if you're participating in a public uh, speaking contest. It can be really uh, so bad that this fear that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you're too stressed about it, it can happen. It will perhaps happen. Uh, and I'm not going to lie, it has several times been this close to, for it to happen to me as well. Um, but I would not overemphasize the importance of this um, this um, happen this um, blackout happening, right? I will give you an example of one of the times that I participated in a, a scientific speaking contest. It was on a um, technical conference on which such a three minute thesis contest was hosted as well. Now there was this girl that uh, had a very interesting uh, research topic, something of ultrasound imaging. Uh, and she started off great. She started, she was super enthusiastic. Uh, and then around one minute in her talk, you could suddenly see her eyes widening with fear, becoming pale as she slowed down and no more words came out of her mouth, right? So the whole audience could see what was going on. She, uh, didn't, she was totally um, forgetting or what she had to say to us so uh, a bit painful and um, well then the question is like what do you do at the moment right but I can assure you that there was nobody in that whole audience who would think for a second that this that this was embarrassing on the contrary right at the evening um, at the dinner people were talking about how brave this uh, this woman this uh, young uh, researcher was to try and step on that stage and talk in front of a large audience of um, 100 people. So I would say like, don't try to think of it as embarrassing. People will um, find it really, they will admire you for doing it regardless how it goes, right? Then I think your most popular fallacy is that you don't have the authority to speak about the, the topic that you're researching about, right? What if the people find out you're a fraud and you're actually don't, you're not so knowledgeable about what you're talking about? Now, this following wall slap, I want to show you an example of uh, someone that's participated there. to the next candidates. And it is my great honor to introduce to you Margot Introduce to you Margot Winters. She's from Belgium, currently doing a bachelor in mathematics and physics. Uh, won a prize last year in astronomy. And she'll be talking about the breaking the wall of star birth. Margot, the floor is yours. Have you ever seen a star being born? Sounds ridiculous, right? But I'm sure you have, actually, without even realizing. See, most of us probably saw an image just like this one on the internet before. Isn't that amazing? I find it amazing. Margot was like the youngest participant at the contest. She was 19 years old. You heard it. She was in her doing still her bachelor's. And she was there together with uh, uh, like nine other PhD students who are doing research for several years. Margot was there as a bachelor student 
with a with a big interest in astronomy and she was talking to us with a lot of energy about um, what she would like to uh, research in the future and the appreciation was immense of the whole audience she won the second place in this edition so i think that uh, it's really not needed to be a professor with 20 years of tenure behind your your um, behind you in order to have the authority to speak on the subject right so forget about imposter syndrome that's what i have to say um then another fallacy which i would like to refute is it takes too much effort to prepare um well I'm not going to deny it. It takes a lot of time, right? It's three minutes, but just like uh, Usain Bolt trains for um, running the 100 meters in less than 10 seconds, of course, this training time takes much longer than that. And that's with many other things the case. But I will leave this one for the panel discussion later this afternoon, because I'm sure that a lot of us have plenty of uh, things to say about it. Then another obstacle that you might think uh, can can be a good excuse to not uh, engage in uh, public speaking is that you can't explain yourself very well right maybe you get lost in your explanation and whatnot um of course try to make it attractive for the audience right but the audience does not come to those kind of um, events or doesn't want to listen to you explaining your research in much detail right you don't have to explain it properly what you need is a good analogy, right? You need a good analogy, a good story, and that is more than enough to keep the attention of the audience. And I would say, like, try to try to simplify your message. Like, what is the one sentence that you would like to ring in the in the heads of your audience when they go home in the evening, right? What is the one thing you want them to remember about your research? They won't remember everything, right? They're reading several candidates talking for three minutes each. It's no use trying to explain it. Try to tell a story. It sticks. And related to that, uh, I also invite you in a poll to uh, share what you would like to use as an analogy for your research. How would you explain it, right? I have my own analogy, which I will show to you uh, uh, just uh, in a few seconds from now. I have my own analogy to talk about my research in epilepsy. Um, which you will see, but I'm very curious also to hear about um, what things you can come up with to um, make it digestible for your audience, what you're researching. Then as a last obstacle that, um, that is often uh, mentioned by people when it's about public speaking or why they are not so enthusiastic about doing it is those first horrible seconds where you have to walk on stage, right? Like, what are you gonna do? They seem to last like an eternity, right? Those first seconds you walk on, all those people staring at you, how do you do that? And for that, I developed a bit my own life hack, which I will show to you also um, in the, the talk that I gave at Falling Walls. So maybe it can inspire you to, to deal or to bypass certain uh, obstacles that you're facing. And with this, I will also conclude um, this part of the talk, at least before the questions. So I'll just show to you what it's like and show you which kind of analogy I used to explain my research. And also in the beginning, um, try to pay attention to which, in which uh, sneaky way I circumvented having to uh, make eye contact with the audience. Oh, fun. It's a pleasure, pleasure for me to announce to you Simon van Eindhoven. He's from Belgium. He has a PhD in electrical engineering that he is applying for. And he will talk about breaking the wall of drug-resistant epilepsy. The floor is yours. Imagine you're on holiday, just strolling around the market, enjoying an ice cream. Then suddenly, a terrible scream. Before you realize what happens, people start yelling. The panic spreads, and everyone now tries to get out of there. Your heart is racing, you drop your ice cream, and you just run. Scary, right? Well, this is what happens in the brain of one out of every 100 people, because they have epilepsy, a disease in which some brain cells generate strong electrical discharges at unpredictable times. 
Just like the scream infects the crowd with panic, those discharges spread through a network of neurons and cause seizures with dramatic symptoms like falling, shaking, but also disturbed emotions. So epilepsy patients live in constant fear of losing control. In one third of cases, medication does not help. Luckily, engineers like me can do something about it. The only real cure is to surgically remove the brain tissue responsible for the discharges, just as if we would take out that troublemaker on the market to avoid future panic. But how to find it? Well, on the market, microphones could detect when there's an abnormal sound. And at that moment, taking pictures of the crowd can reveal where the panic starts spreading. It works the same in medical imaging. We measure a patient with EEG, like microphones on the head that listen to electrical brainwaves, and with functional MRI, like a camera with a slow shutter speed that makes images of active brain regions. Both of these techniques are very limited, but they're complementary. By combining their data, we can discover a lot more. So in multimodal imaging, one plus one is three. Unfortunately, on the market, we can only observe many people at once. And similarly, EEG and fMRI measure only weak and noisy signals from many parallel brain processes that involve billions of neurons. So even though this technique is already part of surgery planning in many hospitals, it's often not successful. That's why in my PhD, I develop algorithms that extract more information from that is hidden in the data. By better modeling the subtle link between EEG and fMRI, those algorithms separate the raw data into relevant patterns, each related to a part of the brain's activity. This helps neurologists to pinpoint the origins of the seizure, and this can help to make surgery more effective in 10 to 20% of cases. Still not perfect, of course, but an enormous difference for those patients because they gain back control of their brains and bodies. And for them, it's a peaceful day at the market again. All right, so this was um, like my talk back at Falling Walls in September last year. So I hope you observed some of the tricks that I tried to explain to you. Um, this is just um, one example of one guy. So, but I hope to uh, spark some conversation and I hope I was able to inspire some of you to um, make your hands dirty and uh, take your first steps in science communication if you haven't done so already. So feel free to reach out if you have any other questions on uh, how I prepared for this or uh, which other uh, difficulties you might encounter and that can be resolved, right? So thank you very much. And thanks again for the organizers uh, to give me the opportunity to share my, my experiences.